All of the children have been warned, I guess you could say threatened. Anything that can be taken away from them has been promised to be taken away from them if on this day they're not on their best behaviors. It's taken three days to get to this point. Three days of children going to bed early just to make sure they're going to be ready for this morning. Three days of men standing around the fire at night talking, wondering about what would happen. Three days of preparing yourself for him showing up. Can you even imagine the conversations? Moses comes out to over a million people and says, spread the word. Now that we've left Egypt, now that we're out here on our way to a place called the promised land, God said he is going to show up in three days. Get your act together. Can you imagine the men around the fire at night, the women around the daily activities and children and watching and just talking and and what you'd be coming up with? I mean, three days of saying this is going to be spectacular. And yet, imagine what they've just seen. They just saw this God unleash plagues on Egypt, brought the greatest nation in the world to its knees. Uh, waters were turned to blood, plagues of frogs and locusts, plagues of hail, plagues of death of the firstborn. And finally, Pharaoh says, get the slaves out of here. You, you get marched to a dead end where now the Egyptian army is hot on your tail. They're coming with anger and revenge for what happened. And waters part? And you're able to walk through on dry ground just to see waters enclosed behind you and swallow up the chariots. And now, Moses said, God's going to show up. Could you imagine the storyline? How do you think it's going to happen? What do you think is going to go on? Could you imagine the imagination and creativity behind the thoughts of how God may do this? All they're told is we've drawn a line around the base of the mountain. When God shows up, anyone who crosses this line will be put to death. In fact, anything that crosses this line will be put to death. Don't bring your pets. Have your dogs on a leash. Cats are on their own. Cats are always on their own. (laughs) This is a high voltage, unattainable, untouchable, unapproachable God. You will be at a distance, but you will see it. And on that third morning, it happens. It starts with a trumpet blast that shakes across the camp. Everyone wakes up to that alarm. Kids are grabbed by the hands and wrists. Families all come out together. Moses leads the way. Everyone gets close to the line. Not close enough where an accidental bump or shove will get you there. But close enough probably to see the line. Close enough to see what's about to happen. And in Exodus, the second book of the Bible, it simply says... Fire falls on this mountain. There's thunder and lightning. There's an earthquake. Smoke comes down, and yet billows of smoke come up from this mountain like a giant furnace, a trumpet blast still happening within. Everyone stands around the base of this shaking, volcanic-type mountain just in awe. And then the voice. Moses. Moses. You may cross the line. Come on up. And everyone stands back as Mo steps across the line. How was that first step, by the way? You walk up to it and then go, he did say me, right? <laughs> You're sure on this one. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Moses goes up and it says the clouds swallowed him and then went to the top of the mountain. And Moses wasn't seen. I'm sure the people sat there for hours. I'm sure somewhere in the dead of night, there was still remnant of people standing around just in awe. The next day you'd look up and see the cloud is still up there. And the next day and the next day and the next day. Moses didn't come down. Have you ever read these stories in the Bible? And one, I I get it, it's me. There's part of me that goes, that's hard to take. Man, that's hard to believe. Did that really? And then secondly, my, my next thing is always, why doesn't God do that anymore? Why can't that, not not like every weekend at North Coast, just once a year, (laughs) just once a year. And on that year, I promise you're inviting friends. Hey, you got to come. This is the weekend that God shows up, thunder and lightning and smoke is a trumpet blast. There's a line, by the way. And your friends go, man, I've heard about that church. I've been been waiting for the invite. Yeah, you got to come. After this, you'll believe. You'll believe. Probably the reason why God doesn't show up like he used to in Exodus 19 is because there's an Exodus chapter 32. And God realized it didn't work. People can get over that. 
Today we have to start there. It's the story behind our text. It's the story behind our story. We've got one of those weird little passages in Hebrews chapter 7 that we're going to be going through today. And I promise you, it makes no sense at all to us today unless we know the story behind it. So if you've opened your Bible to Hebrews, great job, extra credit. Keep something there. We're not heading there for a while. Second book of the Bible is called Exodus chapter 32. It has been 40 days since Moses went up to the top of the mountain. 40 days since Moses has been sitting up there. Now the Bible tells us what's happening up there. Even the people in the camp don't know. God has given Moses specific instructions. You've seen the movie, the big tablets he's about to come down with, 10 commandments. But there's 12 chapters of instructions, not just 10 commandments. Here's how you're supposed to worship me. Here's when you're supposed to worship me. Here is where you're supposed to worship me. Well, which... which we don't have time to read all 12 chapters today, but, but don't let that disappear. God dictates how we worship him. We don't get to believe in God and then go, yeah, this is how I worship him. This is how I do religion. This is how I do church. God goes, no, 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 no. That would make you God. I'm God. I say how you worship me. And 12 chapters with Moses, 40 days up on this mountain, cool stuff happening, back in camp. They come to second in command Aaron and go, what's taking Moses so long? Man, it's been a long time. I think we should come up with plan B. Let's, let's, let's worship God our way. Now, they're not worshiping an evil spirit. They're not worshiping Satan. Let's worship the God that brought us out of Egypt. And they make this golden idol. And there's a drunken feast. And an orgy takes place in the center of camp amongst the children of Israel. And God is on the mountain having this conversation with Moses, and he gets distracted. <laughs> hey, Mo I don't know what line we're on. I'm sorry. I've just, I've just seen what's happening down here. And in Exodus chapter 32, verse 7, we pick up the story we have to know behind our story today. Exodus 32, verse 7, says this. Then the Lord looked at Moses and said, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them. They've made themselves an idol, cast in the shape of a calf. They've bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. That's my God's sarcastic voice. <laughs> They're up on the mountain talking to Moses. He goes, Moses, uh, time out. Wait, have you, have you seen what's going on? Dad, of course you can't see what's going on again. Let me tell you what your people that you lead, that you brought out. You see the pronouns? God's done. Have you ever done this as a husband and wife? Have you ever walked in and said, Amy, you see what your kid is doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's usually Chris. This is your gene pool on this one. And I'm like, yep, yep. Permanent marker shouldn't be used like that. I'll take it. Done. <laughs> it washes off its skin, even face. It takes a few days, but it's okay. We just won't take them outside. This is how the conversations go at the Brown House. Do you see what your kid is doing? God plays the same thing on Moses. You see what your people are doing? You better get back to camp and straighten this out. So Moses comes down the camp. you got to turn the page. We're skipping some of the story because this is the story behind the story. And in chapter 32, verse 19, when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf that they had made, and he burned it in fire. Then he ground it into powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. That's good. When I get to heaven, I want to rent this one. <laughs> How does a guy break apart a calf, burn it, mix it with water, and say, you're drinking it? He say, I ain't drinking it. And he picks up that stick that did so many of the plagues. He's like, you're drinking it. And I'm like, I'm drinking it. Moses just went, Dad, got that vein in his forehead all popping out. You're drinking it. I'm drinking it. <laughs> and now he turns on the rest of the camp. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that led you, that you led them into such a great sin? Oh, no, 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 don't, 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 don't be angry, my Lord. Aaron answered, you, you, you know how prone these people are to evil. So here's how it happened. So they said to me, Make us gods who will go before us because as, as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So I told him, okay, whoever has any gold jewelry, just go ahead and take it off. And then they gave it to me, the gold, and I threw it in the fire and out popped the baby cow. <laughs> Aaron's gone third grade in front of Moses with the vein. What'd you do? It wasn't me. You know, the, you know, the, you know the buddies I'm hanging with at recess and what they're doing and going and I just told them to do it and it just happened. 
You're saying you just threw gold in the fire and a baby calf popped out. Pretty much. (laughs) Moses realizes you can take the people out of Egypt, but you can't get Egypt out of some of the people. God wants to lead these people. Some of these people don't want to be led. There's a cancer in the body. And this cancer will continue to destroy the body. The only way to get rid of cancer sometimes is to cut it out. And drastic choices made. Moses saw that the people were running wild, that Aaron had let them get out of control, and they became a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites, circle that, Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Each man strap a sword to his side. Go back and forth throughout the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded. On that day, about 3,000 of their own people died. And Moses said, you have been, here we go, circle, highlight, underline. Set apart to the Lord today. Circle, highlight, underline. Set apart to the Lord today and draw a little line up to verse 26 where you circled Levites. On this day, the Levites have been set apart to the Lord. For you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. Moses sees the sex play and the drunkenness and the worship and realizes this one's going to hurt. Who's still in this? Who's still for God in this? I'm sure there were other Israelites that rallied, but one tribe, one of the 12 families of Israel came in full force and the Levites stepped up and said, not on our watch. We're not a part of this. Here's what you need to do. You need to go cut out the cancer. We've got over a million and a half people And if this is allowed to stay in the family, it will spread throughout the family. And 3,000 people lose their lives and get removed from the core of Israel that day. And Moses turns to the Levites and said, because you've done this, because you've done the hard stuff, because you've stood for God, even in front of his people, and said, we've got to cut out what's going on. And because you went all the way through with this, today you are set apart. Today you are different than the rest of the nation. Today you have been brought out of this family And you have a new purpose. And over the next 12 chapters or so, they start building this tabernacle where they're supposed to worship God. And when you get to the very end of the book of Exodus, chapter 40, Exodus chapter 40, the second book of the Bible of Moses leading God's people out of Egypt to a promised land to show the world how to walk with one God. Exodus chapter 40, verse 1 simply says this. Believe me, right now you're sitting here in church going, why do we show up? Why are we here today? That has nothing to do with me. I don't care about the religious practices of people in 1600 or 2600 years ago. I get it. I get it. It's going to come to you. It's going to. I promise. Stop thinking about your bracket. It's busted. You have no hope anymore. You understand that, right? That's why we're all in church. You lost those 10 bucks. You're not getting it back. Chapter 40, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day of the month. Place the ark of the testimony in it and shield the ark with the curtain. Bring in the table and set out what belongs on it. Then bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. Place the gold altar of incense in front of the ark of the testimony and put the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. Jump to verse 33. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar And put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. End of the book of Exodus. God's people exiting Israel. Let me just tell you what we've read. And why it's not important to you. But it's about to be. This is the very heart of the Jewish religion. Has just been set up. God tore apart Egypt and said let me have my people. These are my people. And out of my people I'm going to bring a promise that one day will save everyone. Out of my people, I'm going to show the whole world the character of this God and how to come to know this God. These are my people. Here's the problem. I need to show my people how to worship me. 
So he develops the core of Judaism. Here's the place you worship me. And 12 chapters, he says, here's what the tabernacle looks like. Here's where you put the gold ark. Remember Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost One? You've seen the box. This is where I'm going to dwell. Now there's going to be a huge curtain separating it from me. And here's the lab stands, and here's the table, and here's the wash basin, and here's the incense, and here's the altar outside. You're going to start doing sacrifices. A reminder how separate you are from me. I am a holy God, and there is a line that says you shall not pass. I am untouchable because of your sin, because of your actions. This is how you're going to worship me. Every year you're going to have sacrifices to remind yourself blood needs to be shed because of your actions. We're going to get to that in the next two weeks, so I'm not going to talk about sacrifice today. Here's the problem. Who's going to run my church? Now we got a a people of God. We've got a place to worship. Who runs that? Levites. You stood up on this day and said, we'll stand in front of our people, in between people and God. We'll do the hard stuff. We'll point out to people where we've fallen short. Levites, you are not my priest. We have a people of God. We have a place of worship. And now we have the priest. And all the priests, the Levites, they show up for work the next day. And they're like, oh, don't say it. They don't know how to do this. And the Levites cuss. So the very next book of the Bible is called Levites Cuss. <laughs> Leviticus, but that's how you remember it. The Levites cuss. The Levites show up and they're like, you run the temple. And they're like, what do we just make up our, the last time we made up our own way to worship you wasn't a good day. He goes, oh yeah, let me give you an entire book on how you do the sacrifices and how you worship me. It's a book for the Levites so they don't cuss. It's a book for the priest. Here's how you do religion. Leviticus Chapter one, come on, come on, stay with me, stay with me. It's going to have a point in a second. Maybe, maybe it won't. I don't know, sometimes. Leviticus, chapter one, verse one. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from this tent of meetings. And he said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, "Um, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a male without defect. He must present at the entrance of the tent of meetings. So that the Lord will be acceptable to the Lord. He's going to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. It will be accepted on his behalf for him. He is to slaughter a young bull before the Lord and Aaron's sons and priests and the blood and sprinkle in the altar. And the tent of meetings, the skin and the burnt offering and cut into pieces. And this goes on forever. <laughs> and if you ever, ever have trouble sleeping at night, read Leviticus. <laughs> Start at page one. And if you're still awake by page three, you got serious issues. This entire book is about the offerings and the temple and how you do them and how you take them and what happens. And it's like, what's this got to do with us today? Goose egg. Nothing. But this was the very core of Judaism. There's a God that will dwell amongst his people and the raiders of the lost ark. It will have a giant curtain separating it and the outside. Only once a year may the high priest walk in. The rest of the time you are outside this curtain. This tabernacle soon will become the temple in Israel. And this is how you worship. And it went on and on and on. I have my people. I have my place. I have my priest. And now you have the procedures. Judaism is set. And you have to understand that. Because it's taken us 16 minutes to get to our study today in Hebrews chapter 7. I know you're thinking, wait, you're just starting? I thought you were going to close in prayer. You're new to North Coast. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 7. With that turn there, we're picking up on verse 11. Let me welcome those of you from Carlsbad, from Fallbrook, from San Marcos, Escondido, from Ramona, um, from Green Oak Ranch. A special welcome to those of you in East Cape Christian Fellowship down in Baja, our Spanish and English-speaking church down there. Um, Love you guys. I will actually be down with you next Sunday. Uh, Me and my family will be hanging out with you, want to encourage you. I can't wait to fish you again. I mean, to see you again. And it's going to be awesome. That's why we got a place. I'll just be honest. Uh, You heard that. You know it. You're all fishermen. So um, we'll be down there with you guys. We're in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. It's part of that Bible you read and go, no. 
It's part of the Bible you read and go, why didn't Larry just quickly cover that last week and we could start with chapter 8? It's part of that passage I read and go, why didn't Chris Hilkin do that? He's smart enough to figure this out. It's part of that Bible you read and go, it's all about priests and priesthood. We don't do that. It's part of that Bible that once you know the story, you set back and it's Hebrews saying, let me tell you why even the best religion is going to fail you. Let me tell you why whatever you walked in here saying, I checked this box, my family's Roman Catholic, my family's Baptist, my family's Methodist, my family's Pentecostal, my family's Jehovah Witness, my family's Mormon, my family was, you fill in the blank. Let me tell you why even a religion picked by God on that day, handcrafted, is going to leave you falling short. Hebrews 7 says, get done with your religion, people. Get over it. Get over it. Verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, if following what the Levites did as priests, in the temple God built and ordained, with the procedures God gave, if that could have made you perfect, then why did Jesus come? If the religion your family took you to growing up could have made you perfect, then why did Jesus come? All we needed was a little note from God saying, be more religious. (laughs) If religion could have brought you to a point of truly walking with God, then Jesus was useless. And dying on the cross was nonsense. Religion couldn't do it. In fact, in your note sheet, I want you to write this down. Because this is the premise we're looking at today. Then we'll walk through it. If religion could have saved us, then Jesus wasn't necessary. If religion could have saved us, then Jesus wasn't necessary. According to the great research and survey group of Gallup International, Gallup has got some great stuff on American religion. It's amazing to see where religion has gone in our American culture in just a few decades. In 1948, Gallup poll found that 91% of Americans identified as Christians. In 1948, not that long ago, people, in some of your lifetime, 91% of Americans self-identified as being Christian. In 1976, roughly 8 in 10, 81% of Americans identified with a Christian denomination. In 2017, that number, if you add both Protestants, which is the largest religious group of America, 49%, and and 23% that claim a Catholic religion, 72% of Americans claim a religion with Christ at the center of it. And you still look and go, well, that was, just, that was just a year ago. 72% of Americans self-identify being religious in, in the Bible, who Christ is and, and what he did. But let me tell you what's happened in, in religion and spirituality. In the 1950s and 60s, over that decade, it showed that 70% of Americans said religion was very important in their everyday life. And attending their church service or service of faith was important for them and their family. 70% in the 1950s and 60s said, look, it's not just a box we claim. It matters what we do daily. And it's where we attend on a weekend. In 2007, 56% of Americans said religion was very important in their lives. And attending a faith service monthly was important. Today, Only 37% of Americans can be classified as saying religion is an everyday importance in my life and attending a service of faith regularly is part of that. 37% of Americans would claim that. 38% of Americans today gladly check the box none, N-O-N-E, no religious affiliation at all. And yet spirituality is going through the roof in America today. We're done with religion. It's left us wanting. It's left us in two spectrums. Religion makes me feel guilty because I know I'm separate from God. Religion is that big curtain that stands in the way and says, here is God, here is creator, he is holy, he is just. And Chris, 
here is you. And I'm like, I know where I am. <laughs> and they're like, man, you're far. I know. And religion is a drive-by guilting. And it gives me shame. It gives me guilt. And it just once again drives in the fact, wherever God is, I don't match up. Or just as dangerous is the other spectrum. Religious has become a set of rules of do's and don'ts, of things that I must do, hoops I have to jump through. And therefore, it's made me better than others. Therefore, I've actually achieved something. I'm able to work this out. And God does love me more than he loves you. Because look at what I've done with the law and the sacraments. And both sides of religion are incredibly dangerous. One brings guilt and shame and one brings a self-righteousness based on us following a set of procedures. If your religion could have saved you, Jesus wasn't necessary. God developed a great religion and still sent his son to say, it is finished. It is done. We're not doing sacrifices. You don't need the priest anymore. I don't know what group you were brought up in. Today it doesn't matter. Wherever you find yourself on the spectrum, I'm going to challenge you to stop being religious. It's a dead end. My family caught us growing up in in between land (laughs) because of the relationship of my parents and because of how I was brought into this world. They were no longer welcome and part of the Catholic tradition that we were part of. So they jumped ship and went to one of the most conservative, legalistic religions they could find where you couldn't watch cartoons, you couldn't go into homes that had a pool table, guys and girls couldn't swim in a pool at the same time, no card games could be played. It was just redunculous. (laughs) But this was their attempt to achieve. The other side of my family was concerned for me even as an infant. Now I realize being concerned for me growing up was wise, but as an infant, (laughs) when I've done nothing, They had this whole thing where mom and dad needed a date night. Mom and dad just needed to get out of the house and they would babysit me. And they had it set up with the priest that they would take me to the father and I would be sprinkled without my mom and dad present. So at least my butt was covered. And and this is how I grew up in the midst of two worlds, kind of a mixed, weird legalism and guilt and shame of what we have to do to never quite reach up to an almighty God. And Hebrews stops and says, if your religion could have made you perfect, if your religion could have made you right with God, then why did Jesus come? It's a very simple question. Obviously, something has gone wrong in the state of religion. Obviously, God's religion was supposed to show us what was to come and who he was, but this was not the ultimate act of worshiping God. Obviously, something had to take place. Verse 12, here's what happened. You see, when there is a change of priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. (laughs) I mean, why would he have a different priest and keep the same religion? Obviously, everything needed to be scrapped. He of whom these things are said, being Jesus, belonged to a different tribe. And no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from the tribe of Judah. In other words, he wasn't a Levite. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about them being priests. And what we have said is even more clear. If another priest like Melchizedek appears, that's a character we've talked about in the last few weeks, a priest and also a king who wasn't from the tribe of Levi, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside. Your former religion is nullified because it was weak. It was useless. Get out your pen, pencil. Here you go. Circle, highlight, underline. For the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Circle, better hope. Your law makes nothing perfect. But a better hope has now been introduced in which we draw near to God. In your note sheet, write this. If there was need for a new type of priest, there was need for a new type of law. If God brought Jesus to be our one true priest and king to get rid of the priesthood, he goes, doesn't it make sense? He was also abolishing what they stood for. Not that it wasn't good. He goes, but that time is done. Let me show you the hope that that set up. Let me show you the one sacrifice that this was leading to. 
I gave you this law and this worship so that my people would start to see the character of God and walk with this God. But you made sacrifices every year just to show you fall short. It didn't make you perfect. There's no amount of following the pages in this book that can make you perfect. Yes, I've already got communication cards on. You're talking about Old Testament, not the New Testament, right? No, the entire book. I don't follow this to gain anything from God. I don't follow this as religion. I don't follow these pages to obtain anything. Christ has done everything for me. This just shows me how to walk with dad. Your law couldn't make you perfect. In fact, under that, I want you to write this. Simply following the Bible can't save you. If your salvation is because you come to church and you're following these pages and trying to be the best you can, congratulations, you're on your way to being a Pharisee. One of the self-righteous. You've done more than others, therefore you'll probably get into the kingdom. That's a trap of religion. Religion is going to leave you in guilt and shame or a false sense of self-righteousness. That's what religion does. Religion puts a curtain up and says there's a holy God and thou shalt not pass. Jesus has come and says now you can draw near. As several weeks ago I did the approachable, unapproachable God. The God of the Old Testament versus what Jesus did. There is now a perfection that happens is what we're about to look at. But you have to understand, if there was a need to bring a Jesus, there was a need to abolish that whole system. Jesus says, look, it's fulfilled. It's done. The purpose of the law is done. The law was given to constantly show us where we fall short, but that's all it could do. The law was the diagnosis. You went into religion. You went into the machine, and it pointed out cancer, 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 cancer. And the law points out, here's what you've done wrong. Here's what you've done wrong. Here's what you've done wrong. But it can't fix it. The surgeon now has stepped in and said, I'll remove the cancer. I'll remove the sin. I can now make you perfect. The law just pointed out the faults and the blemishes. But it couldn't make you perfect. There's no amount of sacrifice in the world could stand for what you owe God. It was a simple reminder. I don't care what religion you come from, what family background that you've, uh, you've been brought up in. You put them all under Hebrews chapter 7. If that religion could have saved you, how dumb does Jesus feel when he went to heaven? Wait a second, that wasn't necessary for everybody? No. Well, why did I go through all that? Yeah, we were wondering the same thing. Are you serious? God would never institute something that was less than or inferior he says, let me show you your new hope and let me show you by which you can draw near. Verse 20. And it was not without an oath. <laughs> he says, remember, this is the promise of God we've been waiting for. See, it was not without an oath that others became priests without any oath. But he, being Jesus, became a priest when, with an oath. When God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Right next to that, write Psalms 110. Psalms 110. Let me read it for you. It's real short. Psalms 110. David is writing this saying, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. and He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. The writer of Hebrews is going back and saying, let me tell you what Jesus did. And by the way, let, let me use one of your greatest kings in your entire history of Judaism, King David. David himself wrote a psalm, Psalm 110, saying God has promised that he will one day out of us send a priest that will reign forever. He will reign forever. That was done with a promise, an oath. Your priest, your earthly teacher, pastor, leader, they won't set up from a promise of God. Let me read you one more place. Psalm 114. And on that day, in my great and glorious power, I will send to thee Chris Hilkin, who is smarter and wiser than the most, although he looks younger and kind of shocks you at first. <laughs> oh, man. You're like, oh, he's a promise of God. He didn't show up here because he was a promise of God. He was an intern that we liked. 
I showed up here because I couldn't find a job anyplace else. And my wife wanted to come back home. Larry just landed here and you guys kept him for a long time. <laughs> None of us are promises of God. Your priest growing up with wasn't there as a promise of God. He goes, let me tell you, David even wrote about this Jesus God saying, I promise one day I will give you a priest that will override this religious system forever, forever. This is what it's pointing to. You see, number three, Jesus' priesthood was not a position. It was a promise. Jesus' priesthood was not a position. It was a promise. And Jesus says, or the Hebrew says in verse 22, because of this oath, this promise, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Because this is the promise of God. He is the guarantee. He is the collateral put up. He is the security that you have for a better than religion. For something religion couldn't do. This is what we stand on today. This is what makes Chris, Chris. This is why I could never look at this book as a bunch of a to-do list of what I have to do and what I can't do. And it became religion. And let me tell you why we're doing this. Because some of you are like, oh, those souls are religions. But we're North Coast. Oh, people, I promise you, this place can become religion. This place can become where you go and where you spend time to check a box so you can get God on your good side for the rest of this week. This place can become a place where I come on the weekends and I'm in a growth group. Therefore, God, sick them. Take care of my enemies. Bless me. I've jumped through the hoops. Therefore, now God has to. Let me tell you, that is religion. And it's going to leave you feeling guilty, shame, far from. Or it's going to leave you even more dangerous, feeling superior, self-righteous, better than. Verse 23. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. <laughs> You've had a ton of priests and pastors over the year because they die and they don't raise from the dead. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. You don't have enough ink, highlighter, pens, pencils, emojis, stickers, stamps in your purse, wallet, backpack, briefcase to do something with verse 25. I wish you could all make a line and see this. There are three different colors of ink. There is a red square around it. There is highlighting in the middle. This page weighs 10 times what any other page of the Bible weighs just because of verse 25. You heard it. I'm going to read it again. And whatever you have in your grubby little fingers to scribble around, highlight, circle, verse 25. Get this? This is the end of religion. Therefore, exclamation point, circle, highline, he being Jesus is able to save completely. Circle, box, lightning bolt, smiley face, religion, circle, line through it. Those who come to God through him, highlighted twice, underlined in red, because he always lives to intercede for them. In your note sheet, write it down. Jesus did for us what no religion could. Therefore, let me tell you what Jesus did. He abolished religion. A religion that pointed out how far you are from God and what you need to do to earn God. Religion was always about what we must do. Jesus came and says, this is what I have done. Religion separates us from God. Even Judaism, a giant curtain, only once a year, the high priest will go behind and make penance, a sacrifice for the rest of Israel. When Jesus died on the cross, that curtain was ripped from top to bottom. God said, religion is done. You're not separated from your God anymore. You have a way to perfection that no book in the world could ever give you. He is the lamb. He is the sacrifice this whole system has been pointing to. He makes you clean. He forgives you. He washes you white as snow. Oh, Chris, you're still you. Oh, Chris, this is going to help you get rid of the old you and how to walk out a new you, but this doesn't save you. Jesus did that. Oh, Chris, you're still prone to going back to your old self. This book's going to teach you, man, how do I walk with God? How do I walk in this new relationship? How do I walk in the spirit? But this book doesn't give you the relationship. 
This book doesn't give you the spirit. Jesus did that. This is how to walk in what you've walked in. You bought a brand new car. This is just the owner's manual. You don't know how to put gas in it yet. You see the door. You've hit it a few times. You punched it. You wonder how it opens. You find out that under the seat there's a button. You're like, oh, my old one didn't have that. This is a new car. You're waving your foot under the back. You're trying to hit the latch. You're like, I don't know how it works. And you don't shut the hood. You just tap it. It shuts itself. You didn't know that. But this book doesn't give you a car. It doesn't let you earn the car. The vehicle's been given to you. Jesus did it. Religion said, you're far from God and thou shalt not pass. Jesus says, I have passed and now you draw near. You're complete. You're done. Verse 25. He did what no priest, no religion could do. You're in. You don't work for it. You don't try to earn it. You're never going to live up to it. Just start walking it out. And you're going to enjoy all that this vehicle comes with. Or you can go back to being Chrissy idiot and you're going to wrap it around a pole. It's your choice, son. But he gave this to you. You just accept it. The Old Testament law showed us how far from God we were. And it separated us from God. Jesus is a guarantee of a better hope that simply says, draw near to God. Verse 19, draw near. Now you can approach the unapproachable. There's a line that says there is God. And Chris, you can't pass. You're going to be smoting. But with Christ now, God sees me as son. God sees me as Christ. God sees me as perfect. I'm no longer a sinner. I am a saint. I'm no longer what I've done. I'm what Jesus did. And now I approach that line. And Ephesians, or Hebrews chapter 4, we hit it three chapters ago, says now you approach with boldness. Now I come to a line, a place of religion that said that is God and this is you. And now I step over that line with confidence and I walk up and I say, Dad, it's me. I don't get how you see me like this. I don't get how you love me like this. I don't get it, but I know Jesus did it. And now I'm a son and I'm here. I still got a bunch of old Chris. I'm working on shedding that to walk in you and for you to work in and through me in new ways. But I'm not jumping through hoops and I'm not trying to earn anything. I'm not trying to obtain anything. It's, it's finished because of verse 25. Therefore, I now have something no pastor, no religion, no book, no priest could ever do. Someone who can save me, complete me for anyone that comes to God. But you got to come through Christ. Verse 25. He goes, let me, let, me, let me just close this by explaining it to you. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Do you get who Jesus is? Can you put any other father, priest, rabbi, bishop, pastor, teacher you ever grew up under? Can you put them on that list? No. I look back at Father Mick. Father Mick is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners. No, no. Like every other father and priest, he had to ask forgiveness for his sins first. He liked to drink, especially after the high school sporting events. We knew that. It's Father Mick. There is Chris Hilkin, who is holy, blameless, pure. Set, yeah, your laughter, we don't even have to read anymore. He's not even old enough to drive, let alone be holy. We're good. <laughs> But you have a pastor in Larry Osborne, <gasps> mm, Yoda, <laughs> who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Come on, I work with the guy. Get over it. <laughs> None of us put our name in that. You are now in a system of faith led by one who is without sin, who is pure who is blameless, who lives forever, who stands at the right hand of the throne of God and intercedes like no pastor, priest, bishop, rabbi ever could on your behalf. That no matter who I am and what I've done, Jesus says, not that one. Not that one, Dad. That one's ours. That one's ours. I paid for that one. It's done. It is finished. 
Unlike any other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. End of story, end of religion. You see, the law appoints his high priest men who are weak, but the oath which comes after the law, the promised one, appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. Finally, Jesus is enough. He's enough. He's plan A. There is no plan B. He's all that you will ever get and he's all that you will ever need. It's done. Stop jumping through hoops. Stop feeling like you have to earn it. Stop feeling like you have to deserve it. When I talk to people about religion or spirituality, I tend to ask, what do you think God thinks of you? And more often than not, they come up with, well, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. I can always do better. I've never been able to match up. Okay. Tell me what your dad thought of you. Well, I was never good enough. I could never earn it. I could never deserve it. I've never been able to match up. I'm like, isn't it funny? Your God and your dad have the same voice. And let me promise you, whatever earthly father you have, your God has a different voice. Stop trying to match up. Stop trying to earn it. Stop trying to deserve it. God will never, ever love you any more than he does right now. And God will never, ever do anything more for you than he's already done because it is enough. It is enough. That night in the upper room, as every family in the nation of Israel is celebrating that dinner of Passover the exact same way, every family in Israel has sacrificed a lamb. And now they all sit to eat it. With a cup of one day God will send an oath, a promise. Jesus stands in an upper room amongst Jewish followers and said, this is done. I'm the Lamb of God. I'm the last sacrifice. It's my body that's about to be broken on this night. This cup is about my blood. New covenant. New word. New law. No more religion. It's done. We're going to take this outside the streets. We're going to take this outside the gates. If Rome comes and find me in the midst of this city on this night, all hell is going to break loose. And for me to have heaven break loose, I only need to go down. Let's go out to the garden. The disciples can't believe he took 1,400 years of religion and made it about him. 1,400 years of history and made it about him. 2,600 years of a promise given to Abraham. And on that room, on that night, he made it about him. And as they're walking down the streets, now eerily empty and silent, they look through the windows in the candlelight, every Jewish family with the lamb and a cup, every Jewish family with the lamb, every Jewish family through every window in every house, in every home. And they want to scream out, he claims to be the lamb. He's saying he's ending all this. And in three days, I guess we'll know if he can back it up. And now he lives forever to intercede for me. To constantly let God know this one's ours. It's been done. That's our boy. Chris, this isn't about how to get better or get in with me. This is just how to live it out, son. So you can get the most out of this new vehicle. I hope today you're done with religion. I'm going to end in a prayer. When I do that, my bet is there are many of you sitting in here saying, man, I've been playing religion. I've even been using North Coast as religion. I want to verse 25. I want to come and say, God, I'm done. I'm tired. I want to be forgiven. I want to be seen as perfect because I know I'm far from. And in the middle of my prayer, I'm just going to walk you through a prayer. In the middle of my prayer, I'm just going to stop and say, if that's you today, here's all you need to do. See, Romans 3, 23 said, we have all sinned. We do all blow it. None of us can get to heaven because God is pure, holy, no sin in heaven. Congratulations, when you die, that means you won't be there. You're a sinner. He's a just God. That has to be punished. Romans 5, 8 says, though, this God loved you so much that he'll send a son. Romans 6, 23 says, what you earn is separation from God. But Jesus, this gift makes you complete makes you holy. Not enough pages in a book can do that to you. 
And Romans 8 says all you do is confess in your heart, confess with your mouth and believe that Jesus is Lord and he did this for you and you will be saved. It's verse 25. Now we have a God that can completely save us. Anyone who comes to God if you come through him. And I'm going to show up one day in heaven and if God says, why are you allowed in? I'm not going to point out what I've done right or what I've done wrong. That's futile. I'm going to point at Jesus and say, because he took it for me. And I believe that. I followed him because of that. Now, where's my house? <laughs> and the gates will open. What a story. Father, may we constantly be a people that come back to who you are and what you do. May we constantly be a people that come in here week in and week out and into our growth groups, not for the sake of religion and doing and earning points, but for a sake of constantly saying, where do I need to walk with you? To allow all that you've obtained me to have and do flow in me and through me. May we constantly come into these places and campuses and venues simply to say, how do I get the most out of this new vehicle as being son or daughter, prince or princess in the kingdom of God? And how do I get rid of the old Chris so I don't wrap this thing around a tree? And for those of you on whatever campus or venue that are sitting in this prayer saying, Chris, that's me. I need to do this today. I've been, I've been trying to be religious and it doesn't work. Today's the day I want to accept Christ. Then right where you are, just between you and God, just say this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud. You can if you want. You can just say it though between you and God. Just say this. Say, God, thanks for bringing me here today. I really needed to hear this. You know I haven't done things right. And I'm sorry. I've tried to worship you my own way. And it doesn't work. So today I ask for forgiveness. And today I accept that Jesus died on that cross to pay whatever debt I owe you. So today I could be seen in your eyes as perfect. Teach me how to walk that out. Teach me how to walk each day knowing how you love me. Teach me how to love you back. Thanks for forgiving me. From this point on, I'm yours. Show me what that looks like. As I close this prayer, everyone's going to go to their bulletin and take out a little communication card that you were given at the door. If you said that prayer for the first time, our staff this week wants to pray for you individually, not just once, but ongoing. We want to pray for this new journey. So can you just take out that card and just simply write, I said that prayer. That's all we need to know. We just want to pray for you. God, may the rest of us never make this religion. May we never turn to a book of do's and don'ts to try to get right with you. May this never be what we must do to get to you, but what you have done to get to us. And God, may we simply live that out. May you work in us and through us for your purpose, in Jesus' name, amen. And have someone pray for you on this. For whatever reason you need prayer, there's a group up here. If you'd like to go or come back or remain as everyone leaves, take advantage of that. You know, I was in third grade or fourth grade, somewhere in that time of life. I don't remember the year, but I remember that Sunday. It's the only Sunday in that legalistic church I ever remember. It's a Sunday the pastor was in the middle of his message where he's pounding on this big wood pulpit and he's letting us all know why we're bad. And you got no defense on that. I'm just like, yep, yep, yep. And I'm into my coloring. And the choir loft opens up and a group of men all come through the door and they're all locking arms and there's a woman in between the circle of them. And one guy not in that circle breaks out and he grabs the microphone from the pastor and the pastor starts yelling at him and there's an argument and he grabs the mic. In the middle of the message, he lets everyone know that our pastor's been having an affair with this woman in the church office for the last year. And pandemonium breaks out. The pastor's family's in the front row. There's yelling, there's tears, there's crying. Church people are all up in arms, and I'm just sitting there going, this is what I needed. I knew something was wrong with this institution. I just couldn't put my finger on it. But even as a kid, I realized this is what I needed. Even the guy at the very top can't pull this junk off that he's preaching at me. It's religion. There's no life in it. There's no love in it. There's no grace in it. There was no forgiveness in it. It was rules and regulation and laws that not a one of us can follow. It wasn't until my 20s someone separated that religion and Christ's relationship. I'm glad they did. 
We're going to pick it up from there next week. We're going to walk through why Jesus is greater than and this is all you need and why. Until then, turn around and shake someone's hand that I hope kicked the nasty habit of religion today. We'll see you next week. <laughs>